Welcome back. We're going to look at some things on Chapter 24. This is called Political Paralysis in the Gilded Age. Corresponds with Chapter 24 in your book. We're just going to go over a few key concepts here. First, the bloody shirt elects Grant. Okay, uh, The Democrats are going to nominate Horatio Seymour, former New York governor. They're going to denounce military reconstruction or what we know as radical reconstruction. With the military occupation, remember a lot of Democrats were from the South. He's going to win 80 electoral votes to Grant's 214, but the popular vote was a lot closer by about 300,000 votes. Republicans are going to nominate the war hero Ulysses S. Grant. He had absolutely no political experience. And his main job was to hand out patronage, and he's going to do a good job with that, even with members of his family. But with that patronage that he's going to hand out and really doesn't know what he's doing, is going to cause a lot of problems. So his quote's going to be, let us have peace, vote as you shoot, and waving the bloody shirt. In other words, um, you know, it has to do with the victory of war and everything else. He's the war hero. Instead of an era of good feelings, let's look at the era of good stealings. A lot of corruption in the Grant administration. You have railroad scandals, stock market manipulation. We look at this one, Jim Fisk and Jay Gould corner the gold market, and they bribed Grant's brother in law not to release any gold. Black Friday, which is the 24th of September of 1869, almost bought all the gold in the market. Well, finally, federal gold's released, so we don't have this hostile takeover of the gold market. Also, the, the beginning of the Tweed Ring, and you already uh, did some readings about um, that and looked at some things about that. Uh, you have William M. Tweed, known as Boss Tweed, New York City, embezzled $200 million. That's a lot of money back then. The New York Times publishes the evidence, and cartoonist Thomas Nast, which you already looked at continually, draws, draws him out. Samuel J. Tilden, later the presidential candidate, will lead the prosecution. Others are implicated. So Tilden will be the 1876 Democrat nominee out of New York. So this carnival of corruption... Again, Credit Mobiler scandal in 1872. Union Pacific Railroad leaders created this company and hired themselves. A 348% profit distributed stock to key congressmen and the vice president of the United States. The whiskey ring robbed the government of millions in whiskey tax revenue. Grant's own private secretary and Grant's going to protect them. One thing about Grant, he's going to protect his people. William Belknap. The Secretary of War had accepted bribes from Indian agents who supplied the reservations. So this is a period of corruption, 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 corruption. The Liberal Republican Revolt of 1872, these reform-minded Republicans urged purification of the party and end to military reconstruction. They nominated Horace Greeley, editor of the New York Tribune, for president. Democrats will also endorse Greeley... He had blasted the Democrats as traitors, slavers, soon keep, saloon keepers, horse thieves, and idiots. Mm -hmm. Republicans will nominate Grant for a second term, who was easily elected 286 to 66 electoral votes. They'll pass an amnesty act for Southerners to vote to lower tariffs and promote mild civil service reform. So they try to go after the Grant, but Grant, again, he's the war hero. It's, it's really hard. For some reason, Grant um, is able to escape all these scandals um, leading up to his reelection in 1872. These reform-minded Republicans, just keep in mind, eventually going to become your prog progressive Republicans later on. Depression, deflation, and inflation. This panic of 1873, which is a big deal, there's an overbuilding of railroads, mines, factories, and farms. When you overbuild stuff in a free market, eventually it's going to come crashing down. On top of that, there were bad loans. No profits, no payments led to foreclosures. So you have all this money out there to overbuild the economy. When the economy slows down, these bad loans are going to lead to massive foreclosures and economic ruin. You have hard money versus cheap money. Agrarian and debtor groups want greenbacks. That's paper money or Civil War money to be reissued. Why they need money to pay off the loans. Hard money advocates are creditors wanting to be paid back with gold and silver coins. <coughs> Grant veto to build and make more greenbacks. So Congress passed the Resumption Act of 1875, which will buy back greenbacks and gold at face value by 1879. So understand, 
Cheap money people are farmers and people that owe money. There isn't enough money in the system for them to obtain, so their prices had to be low because there wasn't a lot of currency or, or, or gold in the market. They had these loans they had to pay off, but because there was only so much gold in the economy, they couldn't get enough money to pay back the loan, so they wanted more money in the system. Those are your cheap money people. Your hard money advocates are the creditors, okay? They want to be paid back what they loaned out. If you put more money in the system, the value of the greenbacks would be less than the value of the loans in the first place. So they would lose money. So you have one side that can't pay and they're going to ruin. Well, the hard money people believe if you put more money in the system, they'll be ruined. So I just want you to understand the differences in opinion because this is going to come back after the panic of 1873. It's going to be prevalent in all the presidential elections, 1880, 84, 88, particularly 1892 and 1896 has to do with hard versus cheap money or the silver rights versus the gold bugs, which is going to come later. So cheap money advocates now promote silver attacking the 16 to 1, which is 16 ounces of silver to one ounce of gold. In 1870, a seven-member Supreme Court declares the Civil War legal tender, these are the greenbacks, what we know as paper money today, as unconstitutional. With congressional approval, Grant adds two members to reverse the decision. In 1871, they do, they do so. Now there are nine members of the Supreme Court, and that's how many members are in the Supreme Court today, nine. And that came in 1871. The Coinage Act of 1873, no more civil coins, is considered the crime of 73. So there's going to be a contraction of the money supply, less money available. That's really going to hurt farmers and Westerners. The Resumption Act of 1875, few people turned in their bills for, for, for the uh, gold. So that was a problem. And it spawns the Greenback Labor Party in 1878. And they get a million votes and 14 members of Congress. That's significant, guys. That's pretty significant. So this is going to be a major, major, major economic question for quite a few presidential cycles. Pallid Politics in the Gilded Age. All right. The Gilded Age is a sarcastic name given by Mark Twain. That what politicians are only concerned about, you know, gilded is gold, they're only concerned about money and their power. They fight over patronage. Every presidential election was close and every little separated the part very little, excuse me, separated the parties. And that's true. Very little did separate the parties. It's who could basically get their vote out? And that's why they would go after a grant, a war hero. They try to go after people that are popular. They go for nominees, except for Grant, from the popular states, most populous, like New York and Ohio. That's where you're going to see who can get more of a vote out because they were pretty much the same. So, the Democrats were Lutherans and Roman Catholics, white South, northern cities, and the political machines. The Republicans were Protestants and strict codes of morality believed government should regulate the economy and morals. Support from small-town New England and Midwest and the Grand Army of the Public Civil War veterans. Where was the split? The stalwarts versus the half-breeds. Okay, so you have Roscoe Conklin, which was the stalwarts, and the half-breeds backed by uh, Maine Congressman James G. Blaine, who would be the Speaker of the House. So the election of 1876... Is the Hayes Tilden standoff? Hayes is the three time governor of Ohio. Samuel Tilden bagged Boss Tweed and led the prosecution in New York. So, again, Ohio versus New York. Tilden, the so called reformer. Hayes, the stalwart governor from uh, Ohio. So, there's going to be 20 disputed electoral votes in Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida. Both parties had sent delegates to the Electoral College. Okay? So, you have. Electoral college delegates from both parties represented in those states. Tilden, from election day, was one vote short of the 185 needed. And he led the popular vote. So you look like he's in the driver's seat to be the next president, right? The deadlock was to be settled by an electoral commission of eight Republicans and seven Democrats. Why? Because the Republicans controlled Congress. So we'll see what happens here. 
Here's the Compromise of 1877, and it is the end of Reconstruction. First, the Electoral Commission would vote down political lines, electing Hayes, first of all. There was almost a second civil war. That's something that's really not really talked about. So there had to be a compromise. And here's the compromise. Troops leave the South. Okay, they were only in two states, Louisiana and I can't remember what the other state was. Texas, I believe. Two, Democrats will gain some patronage, help towards Southern Transcontinental Railroad, and have two members in a new cabinet. One would be the Postmaster General, which gives out a lot of patronage that we talked about. Black equality is abandoned in the South. In other words, the Northerners and the federal government are going to look the other way on black equality because they continue to push it. They continue to be a resistance in the South. The Civil Rights Act of 1875 should have equal public accommodations and equality in jury selection. Should have. Not they must or shall, but should have. In other words, it's a backing off of insisting on equality or equal public accommodations. And of course, this isn't going to be enforced. The Civil Rights Cases of 1883 waters down the 14th Amendment by saying that the 14th Amendment is only meant government violations of civil rights, not individual violations of civil rights in the states. So you're going to see black equality abandoned, and the, and the federal government is going to back off, and the Supreme Court is going to, through the Civil Rights Cases of 1883, reinterpret the 14th Amendment and really water it down. And what it does is it paves the way for 60-some-odd years of Jim Crow and 60-some-odd years of discrimination against African Americans, particularly in the South. And there it is here. So the Democratic South, suppression of the blacks. Okay, These redeemer governments of freedmen face unemployment, eviction, and physical harm. The redeemer, they're redeeming the old South. Sharecropping and tenant farming equals a crop land system, which is basically another form. You can really look at it and can interpret it as another form of somewhat slavery. The Jim Crow laws are at the state level segregation laws, and where the federal governments can look the other way. And then the, the, the decision by the Supreme Court, Plessy versus Ferguson, codifies it with this separate but equal facilities nonsense. What also is going to happen in the South is lynching. Blacks lynched for the crime of asserting themselves as equals. They'll be attacked by people, killed, hung. Um, Think of the KKK, the rebirth of the KKK, or the birth of the KKK, actually. There's going to be class conflicts and ethnic clashes. Since the Panic of 1873, railroad workers had very hard times. Their wages were cut by 10%. That's a huge cut. The Great Railroad Strike of 1877 is a general strike affecting 10 states and over 100 people were killed. When you look at early labor strikes and strife, it was very violent and extremely dangerous. Not uh, unlike today. Uh, Today it's contentious, but you don't really see people dying in strikes and demonstrations. Federal troops were sent in to stop the strike, impeding the federal mail. Well, if you stop the railroads, the mail isn't going to be moved because they didn't have airplanes back then. So the justification to step in is that you're stopping federal mail. So to step in. Racial and ethnic conflict. You have the Irish and Chinese in California. Uh, Dennis Kearney, Kearneyites, violence and cutting off pigtails led to what? The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And U.S. versus Wong Kim Ark. In 1898, guaranteed citizenship to all citizens born in the United States. But a lot of this stuff is going to be ignored. Okay? So we're going to have real problems with that. We can discuss more of that in class. Garfield, an author, in the 1880 election, the Democrats nominate Winfield Scott Hancock. The Republicans are going to nominate James Garfield, a dark horse Republican and then Vice President Chester A. Arthur in New York are stalwart. The stalwarts were the ones that were giving up the patronage, the old school kind of thing. Garfield was a dark horse. He's supposed to be more of the of the uh, the more of the establishment. Okay, they win the election in the Electoral College two fourteen to one fifty five. The ironic thing, Garfield's supposed to be you know somewhat of a you know 
keep the old guard. He's assassinated by Charles Guiteau over his spoils. He was disappointed because he was not rewarded with a public job, so he goes and kills the president. Author, a stalwart, promotes reform and gets Congress to pass the Pendleton Act of 1883. It's the Magna Carta of civil service reform. Jobs based upon a competitive exam and place the civil service commission in charge of appointments. This is going to guarantee that Author will never be nominated for president again. Because Author, when he was the head of the Customs House in New York, that was huge patronage. It was all about you know who knew who and the political jobs and all that kind of stuff. So for him to come in become president after the assassination of Garfield and sign the Pendleton Act was a slap in the face to, you know, to the old guard. They wanted the patronage to be delivered by the president. And he actually went against it. He became a reformer to the chagrin of, of the uh, bosses um, throughout the country. So there's no way in 1884 author is going to be renominated. And what they do is they, they nominate Blaine, so it's going to be James G. Blaine against Grover Cleveland, okay? So under Blaine, burn this letter, end of a letter linking politics with corruption. You have Rom, Romanism and Rebellion. <laughs> he loses New York, and the Mugwumps left the Republican Party to support reform. Blaine was no reformer. Blaine was going, it was a, uh, someone that was going to come in and reestablish the whole patronage thing. These mugwumps are going to leave the Republican Party um, over this because they want reform in the system. The Democrats are going to nominate Grover Cleveland. And Grover Cleveland was a one-term governor of New York, a couple-term uh, uh, mayor of Buffalo, New York. Grover Cleveland rose very, very fast. Within six, not even six years, I think four to six years, he's going to rise to the uh, Democratic nomination for president. He was a reformer, very honest. And he would always say, a public office is a public trust. He wins a narrow election over Blaine. The elections over personalities, not policy. Cleveland was liked a bit more than Blaine. And if you look at Cleveland as president, today, yeah, he was a Democrat then. He was a very conservative Democrat in a lot of respects. So old Grover is going to take over. He he vetoed a bill that would have provided seed for drought-ravaged Texas farmers. Though the people must support the government, the government should not support the people. He will name two former Confederates to his cabinet, help soothe relations with North and South. He'll cave into the spoil system because he's more concerned about vetoing bad bills than worrying about the spoil system itself. Military pensions, widespread money is given to Civil War veterans. Cleveland reads each and vetoes hundreds of bills. He didn't believe in giving out a lot of money from the taxpayers. He was a fiscal conservative, big time. And that's going to give him problems leading into 1888 to get renominated. He's going to get renominated, but he's going to lose because of it. Remember, the country is closely divided at this time, this reconstructed United States. So Cleveland's going to battle for a lower tariff. It's been high since the Civil War. The Treasury had a surplus of $145 million. Pork barrel spending was common. What is pork barrel spending? It's considered wasteful spending for special interests. So if there's pork barrel spending, we're going to spend $2 million on you know, looking at the, the backward walkings of mice for a laboratory. That's considered pork barrel spending. Programs or or a bill to pay for things for special interest groups that don't seem to have a real public need. Cleveland felt that a lower tariff meant lower prices for consumers and less protection for monopolies. He also believed the less money you bring into the government, the less it will waste. And he, he would write about this time and time again in veto messages and his idea about taxation. The more you brought in, the less that could be wasted. The tariff issue becomes the main issue of the election of 1888. Cleveland runs for the Democrats, and the Republicans nominate Benjamin Harrison, the grandson of William Henry Harrison, who had the 30-day uh, presidency. Harrison will win the Electoral College 233 to 168, but he loses the popular vote to Cleveland. So that's going to set up a rematch in 1892. So you have the billion-dollar Congress. The Republicans have a thin lead in the House. Thomas Czar Reed becomes Speaker of the House and pushes legislation through. Pensions to Civil War veterans. 
government purchases of silver, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890, to be able to regulate uh, the value of that. The McKinley Tariff, he was a senator then, 48.4% of the highest peacetime level. That's a high tariff on goods coming in, 48.4%. In the midterm elections, the Republicans lost, dropping to 88 seats versus 235 Democrats, also nine members of the Farmers Alliance, a militant organization. So this whole billion-dollar Congress didn't do do so well. So in the 1890 midterms, the Democrats are going to have a, a huge majority in the House of Representatives. So there's going to be a lot of discontent out there. The People's Party or the Populists, they met in Omaha, Nebraska, and they had an Omaha platform demanding this. Free and unlimited coinage of silver. Why to offset gold? To put more currency into the system. A graduated income tax. It means the more money you make, the higher rate that you make. It's like what it is today. Back then it was a flat rate. Well, back then there really wasn't even an income tax because it was unconstitutional. Graduated income tax was unconstitutional because the Constitution reads that taxation must be equal across the board. And the 17, I think it's the 17th Amendment that for the income tax will change that. Third, government ownership of railroads, telegraph, and telephone. The populace, if you look at it, it's kind of socialism. Graduated income tax and government ownership of major utilities, railroad, telegraph, and telephone. Okay? Four, the direction election of U. Excuse me, the direct election of U.S. senators. Something I've railed about that I've I've opposed. So what it does is it takes, the, in my opinion, takes the state government out of the process in the federal government. One term limit on the presidency. That's interesting. Adoption of initiative and referendum. Initiative is when you put forth. Um, an idea on a law to, to let the government know what the people are thinking. A referendum is when the people put forth a law that should be binded and voted by popular vote in an election. A shorter work day. An immigration restriction. Okay, And they nominate James, General James B. Weaver. If you look at this platform in 1892, it is definitely the platform of progressivism that's going to be embodied by Theodore Roosevelt in his first his, his own outright term and by, well, not really by Taft, but also by Woodrow Wilson and moving on. This is definitely the, uh, the, uh, the basis of foundation of a 20th century progressivism right here from the populists. So more discontent, the homestead strike of 1892 at, the, at a Carnegie Mill. The steel workers are angry over pay. James Frick, working for Carnegie, hires Pinkertons to bring up the strike. The Pinkerters were hired mercenaries or hired cops, basically, as security guards. Um, Carnegie is conveniently in Scotland. He knows what's going on. He knows what kind of guy Frick was. He wanted Frick to kind of crack down on the labor costs and stuff, and Carnegie thought it was best that he was out of the country when this was going on, but he was in contact with Frick. So these Pinkertons come in with guns and weapons and stuff, and there's a battle that ensues. Ten are killed and 60 are wounded, and federal troops need to be sent in to stop the strike and break the Union. All the time when there's been strikes during this period of time, the government would be on the side of the companies or management. Federal troops also brutally put down a strike in Cora Delane, Idaho. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but I attempted it. The populace made a remarkable showing in the 1892 presidential election, gaining a million votes and 22 electoral votes in four states of Kansas, Colorado, Idaho, and Nevada. The populace becoming very popular in the Midwest and the West. Because Midwesterners and Westerners were suffering under the economic policies at the time. They were civil rights because they needed more money in the system to be able to pay off their debts. Again, something that goes all the way back to the Panic of 1873. The South is going to be divided along racial lines. Blacks will vote Republican and the whites will vote Democrat. That's basically what the South was. You had the Color Farmers Alliance. If Tom Watson, Georgia, appeals to their votes, 
Okay, but bourbon elitism has prevailed, and what that means is Jim Crow, the grandfather clause, and Jim Crow laws where segregation in public places is basically codified. You know, separate uh, drinking fountains, separate places to sit, on a not on a bus then, but a train or wherever else. Legalized, instituted segregation. Cleveland in the Depression. Cleveland's the only president elected after his defeat. So he's going to get elected again in 1892. But right after he gets elected, what kicks in is the Depression of 1893. Thank you, economy. It may have been worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s. You have railroad overbuilding, same as 1873, overspeculation, labor disorders, Agricultural depression, you can blame the whole uh, anti-silver right or the gold bugs for that. Free silver hurt the international market and European banking houses demanded repayments and glowed, lowering the gold reserve. So the side that's pushing free silver and getting their way, the problem is it's going to hurt the international market. Because the European banking houses, they want gold. So that's going to cause a huge problem. 8,000 businesses are going to collapse in six months. Railroads went under, the Philadelphia and Reading Railroads. Soup kitchens and hobos common. Local charities were hard-pressed. Back then, guys, when you lost your job, that was a local function to help you, either from a church, synagogue, or the local government giving monies to the local almshouse or the local asylums is how people were helped. It was not a state function nor a federal function. You need to understand that. And the federal government's position is going to be let nature take its course. That was their philosophy. We're not going to intervene and put money in there because they believe they'll cause a whole myriad of other problems. Legal tender notes had to be issued for silver purchased. This is paper money. Could be traded for gold, and this also drops the gold supply. Since silver was one obvious problem, Cleveland calls Congress into special sentence to repeal it. William Jennings Bryan makes a plea for silver. Cleveland breaks the filibuster and alienates free silver faction of the Democrat Party. Okay? And what Cleveland's going to have to finally do, he's going to have to go to J.P. Morgan, the financier, the banker, for, to be able to pump into the economy $65 million worth of gold. So, Cleveland splits his party. Half of his party, the free silver types. He has to go in and stabilize the gold market. That's going to guarantee he's done politically, and it's going to hurt the Democrats. It's definitely going to hurt the Democrats moving forward. They're not going to elect another president until 1912. So for 20 years, after 1892, they're not going to elect another president. Democrat president for 20 years. Cleveland is blamed for selling out the J.P. Morgan business interest. Morgan had made $7 million on the gold loan to the government. The Wilson-Gorman tariff of 1894, not much percentage drop over McKinley tariff, a 2% tax and incomes over $4,000. Cleveland allows the bill to become law without a signature. In the midterm elections, Republicans won back lost majority in Congress. So that majority that they lost back in 1886, they're going to get it back in 1894. Cleveland is going to be blamed for the Republican rebound. But again, Cleveland's dealing with the split Democrat Party when it comes to the free silver and the gold question. And again, that's going to hurt the party for some time because what's splitting out of the Democrat Party are the populists. Eventually, they'll become progressives along with the split in the Republican Party that's going to happen with progressives. So this whole thing about forgettable presidents, the word Lilliputian has come into common use and meaning very small-sized. Okay. And Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Harrison, and Cleveland are all considered forgettable presidents largely because they did so little and they were controlled by Congress. I don't necessarily agree with all that. You have to look at, for sure, Cleveland can't be considered forgettable, in my humble opinion. 
He vetoed a lot of bills. He was probably the last of the conservative Democratic presidents. And he's more, I believe, a victim of the split in the Democrat Party, just like Taft is going to be a victim of the split in the Republican Party in 1912. So I don't necessarily agree with with, uh, Cleveland being put there, but, I mean, Garfield, the poor soul, was assassinated a few months in. Chester Arthur, eh, really. Um, Harrison, no one cares. But Garfield, I'm not so sure about that. And that's it. Until the next one. Thanks.